Hello, everyone. My name is Clint Wyckoff, and welcome to AWS Supports You. I'm an enterprise support manager, and I'm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Here at AWS Supports You, we bring AWS support experts online to provide you with tips to optimize your performance in the cloud, lower your cloud costs, as well as provide you with best practice and design considerations. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about AWS support and the various options that we have, I'm going to toss a link here in the chat right now. Just do that there. Uh, today's topic is Amazon Aurora Serverless, and joining me from AWS Enterprise Support is Harish and Kieran. Uh, so let's start off with you first, Harish. Can you give us a quick introduction, then Kieran? Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Harish, and I'm a Senior Technical Account Manager at Amazon, and uh, I'm from public sector, and I'm based out of Virginia, United States. I help customers with their cloud modernization and migration. I would love to help them with their any issues that they run into while migrating. Nice meeting you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Harish. Thank you, Clint. Hello, everyone. My name is Kiran, and I'm a database specialist account manager. I work with specialist uh, technical account manager team, and uh, I've been with AWS for almost five years now. I work with the enterprise customers, help them to review their instances and provide the operational best practices. Also review their well workload and uh, help them to tune their instances. Thank you for joining today's session. Nice. Thanks, Harish. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your busy day to join us here on AWS uh, Supports You. So folks online, we do have some database specialists with us today. And the focus of the conversation is going to be around adopting Amazon Aurora serverless. Uh, and we're going to focus on different capabilities and differences between uh, Aurora provisioned and serverless v2. We're also going to talk through some migration tips along the way. Uh, but before we get into the details of the presentation and the demo that we have lined up for you, we're asking the attendees, you folks that are joining us online today, to please toss your questions that you have for Kieran and Harish in the chat. We'll be answering those live. Uh, we will take a few breaks throughout the course of the session. We'll address those questions, toss them in the chat so we can get them queued up for you. Uh, <clears throat> additionally, we are interested in hearing your feedback. So we at AWS Supports, you would like to know future topics that you might be interested in learning about. And the best way to let us know that and give us feedback about the show is to take uh, our survey that I just posted a link in the, the chat there. That'll give you the direct the ability to interact with us directly and give us your feedback on what you might like to see in a future episode of AWS Support 2. So with those administrative items out of the way, uh, Harish, I'm going to toss it over to you and you can take it from here and we'll check back in a few minutes. Thank you, Clint. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. So in today's session, we are going to talk about adapting Aurora serverless. So as a part of agenda, we are going to talk about what is Aurora serverless. We'll see what are the supported regions, versions, and we'll do a comparison between uh, provision Aurora and Aurora serverless V2 features. And we'll look into the, how to migrate and the tools that are available to migrate. We'll touch base on pricing. And at any given point of time, if you have questions, feel free to have your questions posted in the chat. We'll answer that for you. Let's get started. So now, what exactly is Aurora serverless? So it is, in a nutshell, on-demand and auto-scaling configuration. What I meant by that, if you look at provisioned Aurora, you would have to provision the compute resources. Even when you are not using it, you are going to use or pay for the compute resources that you have provisioned. And in contrary, when you look at Aurora serverless, you are not exactly going to uh, pay for the compute resources when you are not using it. It will scale based on the demand of your application and it will scale up to the requirement. And once the workload is served, it is going to scale down based on your workload speeds. So which means it is pay as you go service, which is super cool to have, rather than having to pay for resources if, uh, when you are not using it. And at the same time, if you ask, uh, or a couple of customers asked me, do I happen to have any performance impact with scaling? And I would answer that you would not see any performance impact. During our previous sessions we had with the customers, that was the first question I was being asked. Like Harish, when it is scaling up or scaling down, 
do we happen to see any performance impact or impact to the flights or connections that are in flight so i would say that you would not be impacted for any of the connections or application workloads that are in flight now let's look at the storage layer even when we say it's a serverless we still need to have the storage that is hosted somewhere in the data center right so when you look at the storage layer aurora serverless is no different than the provisioned aurora which means we still have the same six way replication that is being served which means which is replicated the storage nodes are replicated across three multiple availability zones which means even when a specific node is impacted we are still not going to lose the quorum you would still have the data that is being served by the application and from the database which is super cool which means we are still going to use the same storage layer that we have in the provision aurora and now let's look at what kind of workloads that would fit and benefit by using aurora serverless in near real world you would see that during holiday season which we recently had during thanksgiving all the retail companies they definitely would have spike in the workloads right in those kind of scenarios if you go into the pre serverless or on prem uh, life cycle we would have to do months of study to make sure that the workload is tested properly and capacity is procured and racked to make sure that the servers are ready to serve the workloads which was hassle and it also uh, requires multiple hours of customer and labor hours involved to do numerous testings and capacity procurements with serverless and cloudization you would see that most of the customers have to completely uh, get rid of overhead of you doing this capacity procurement we as cloud providers would take care of doing that capacity management for you and where the customers can completely rely only on doing the important work of coding or doing main uh, planning of their applications to modernize the applications we, and coming to serverless you would see that even when you do not know the actual capacity that is required what you can do is based on the uh, on prem servers that you have or the provisioned aurora that you have you would be able to test what is the provisioned compute resources and for the uh, testing purpose in your lower environments you can procure and configure what's called acu in the serverless you would configure aurora capacity units which is going to replace your compute layer which means that you would provision what is the minimum acu that you would require and what is the max acu that means you have control of scale up operation too so that you can manage it from the cost perspective and coming back to our topic on what exactly are the workloads that will be a good fit for the serverless any instant uh, workloads that need an instant spike in the capacity or any fine granular uh, applications that do not anticipate or that can't handle any disruption in the capacity and whatever applications need high availability these are the three different application strategies or scenarios that would be a good fit for the aurora serverless in near real time if you look at the workloads all these graphs that i captured are either read io or write io or read or write throughput and if you look at these workload trends you would see that there is a huge spike in the serverless in uh, the workloads and they would scale down and you would see that it is again get, getting back to the normal workloads any of the workloads that you would see in the cloudwatch metrics with these kind of trends you would be able to see that this aurora serverless would be a good fit for these kind of workloads i'll give a pause here and see if uh, there are any questions yeah hey rich we did have a few questions uh two specifically that came in i want to hit on the the second one that came in uh first and this is from nothing is impossible uh can you talk us through sort of what type of database platform Aurora is as compared to maybe, you know, uh, Dynamo or other database engines that are out there? So Aurora serverless is, uh, it falls into relational database family. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you look at DynamoDB, it's a NoSQL engine. So Aurora is a relational database engine that we are offering and it comes in two different flavors. If you look at Aurora serverless, we support it in both MySQL and Postgres flavors. 
if you look at our public documentation you would get more insights on what exactly are the versions that are supported under serverless v2 which is the latest version mm -hmm. and i think we're going to talk about that a little bit as well as we go along in the in the session so how would that so how would aurora serverless compare to lambda for example because we never we hear of lambda we oftentimes get it compared to serverless technology as well so like what's can you compare and contrast the differences there for us so if uh, technically speaking, if you look at Lambda, it is data driven uh, triggering mechanism, which means if you look at uh, on-prem uh, servers, the feature that I can compare Lambda with is task scheduler, which means if you want to schedule a task where it needs to be triggered at a specific point of time with a configuration, that's where I would like to compare Lambda with. When you look at the databases, Aurora is a database engine where you can store the data in the databases on that specific server. So mm -hmm. I would say uh, technically, even when Lambda is also able to scale and do concurrent connections, it is not actually a database engine. So it is data-driven uh, triggering mechanism that gets triggered and executes logic that is being con uh, integrated or incorporated into the Lambda function. Right. So I think what you're saying there is like it's an event driven. So something needs to occur. Some sort of event needs to happen, which triggers off the Lambda that can either be a cron schedule or maybe uh, something gets uploaded to an S3 bucket that triggers off an event for a Lambda to run. The other point that I would highlight there, uh, nothing is impossible, is the fact that it's based solely on code that your application developers would write. Exactly. Um, so you don't have to worry about the managing the servers. All you need to do is uh, manage the code that runs in the runtime whenever that uh, Lambda uh, function is, is triggered. Uh, so hopefully that helps. The second question that came in there is from Father Goblin. And are there any workshops that are out there that you're familiar with, Harish, that demonstrate Aurora serverless using infrastructure as code? Sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, so the, the question was, are there any workshops that you're familiar where you can run Aurora serverless using infrastructure as code? Uh we need, we should have a couple of public facing dogs, uh, uh, on, blogs on this one. I can definitely look for that and share it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd be curious. Are you looking for cloud formation or Terraform or what's your infrastructure uh, as code platform of choice? Uh, you can toss that in the chat. The other thing is if you're using Aurora today or you're looking at Aurora, give us a plus one over in the chat. I'd be curious to see how many of the folks online um, are using Aurora today for either, you know, development or production use cases. So I think that's all the questions for now, Harish. You can feel free to take it away and check back again in a few minutes. Thanks, Glenn. Sounds good. Keep that questions coming, team. <laughs> and now look at the supported regions. Uh, usually when we launch a server or a feature or a service, we release it in a specific targeted regions and we expand that support to multiple regions. Coming to Aurora Serverless V2, Aurora Serverless V2 is currently supported in more than 20 regions. If you look at our public documentation, you would find all the regions that Aurora Serverless is currently supported in. This list goes on and on because this is not the only list that is going to get exhausted with. We are continuously going to add the new region uh, based on the feedback that we receive from customers. So please keep an eye on our public documentation and also the what's new so that you will get to know what exactly are going to be the new regions where uh, or a features that are going to add, get added to the other serverless v2 and coming to supported versions whenever we launch a server or a service you would see that that service requires a minimal version in which the uh, it needs to be chosen to be able to function and operate similarly in aurora serverless v2 if it if it needs to be operated and launched it needs to have a minimum requirement of major versions that it needs to be in. And as of today, Aurora Serverless offers two different flavors. One flavor is MySQL, another flavor engine is Postgres. So if you want to use Aurora Serverless V2, you either need to be on MySQL 8 or Postgres 13 and 14. You can be on any of these versions if you want to use Aurora Serverless V2. I added a couple of features that were introduced in each of these engine types. And you can go to uh, MySQL and Postgres public documentations where you can get more insights on what exactly these features are. And as of now, what we did was we learned about what exactly is Aurora Serverless V2. And we looked at the region supported. And also we looked at what all the 
workloads that would be a good fit for Aurora Serverless V2. Now let's look at a demo on how do we create Aurora Serverless V2 database. I, this is a quick demo that I captured from one of my test environment. I'll, I'll pause in between so that uh, I can walk through the process. This is the RDS console in AWS. And to get to this page, you have two different ways to get here. One way is when you log on to the AWS, you will have an option to search for the databases. And when you search for RDS, it will get you to this specific page. If not, if you already have used RDS earlier, you would see that under recently used services. Once you get into this RDS console, you have an option for create database. So I am going to play the video and I'll pause wherever it makes sense. When you click database, it is going to populate and bring you to this new page. And in this new page, you will look at all the supported engines that you have in uh, offered by RDS. And if you see, currently we are only going to focus on Aurora. So I chose Aurora and there are two different flavors of engines that are supported, MySQL and Postgres. And this is going to show native. If you want to see what all the versions that are supported uh, for V2, you would have to scroll this option or turn on this button so that it will show you the versions that support Aurora serverless V2. And if you see in the drop down, since you're on MySQL, you would see MySQL 8. When you switch to post, your versions compatible that are 13. And recently we have added a support of 14. So you would either be choosing Postgres or MySQL based on your use case. And when you scroll down, here is where you would provide settings and give options on what exactly needs to be the name of your Aurora cluster. Since it is still Aurora cluster platform, Based, you are going to provide the cluster name and you would give the uh, username and password for your Aurora cluster. For this test purpose, I gave demo serverless as the name and this is where you would provide Aurora capacity units. So if you go back to your native Aurora cluster, when you are trying to launch the Aurora cluster, you would provision the compute resources and you would choose which instance class type you want to choose while provisioning Aurora serverless server but you are choosing Aurora serverless. So here you would not see the instance class types, but instead you would see something called ACUs, which is Aurora capacity units. And in Aurora capacity units, you can configure what exactly is the minimum and max ACU you want. So what exactly is ACU? Let's talk more about ACU. So what Aurora capacity unit is, it is a combination of two gigs of memory and corresponding CPU and RAM that would be able to suffice for an instance to be able to launch. And having said that, when you choose a minimum of ACU, the minimum you can go for is 0.5. And as per design, you cannot go any lower than 0.5. So which means based on the workload, let's say if your workload is not required to scale up and if it is lower than what exactly your daily day-to-day -day workload looks like, it definitely scales down to a minimum ACU that you have configured. And you are going to provide min and max ACUs here, and you can go from 0.5 to the max of 128 Aurora capacity units. And underlying storage, since this is Aurora, you are not going to provision the storage. It auto scales by, from 10 gigs to 64 terabyte or 128 terabyte based on the engine that you're choosing, which is MySQL or Postgres. Once you choose those options, and in Aurora serverless v2, we have additional features where you would be able to create real replicas, configure multi-AZ, which was not available in the previous Aurora serverless version. And you will choose those options and I'm leaving all the other options default. And based on your requirement, you can choose whatever makes sense for your workload. And when you choose all these options, you have an option to create database to the top or bottom right. When you click that, you would see that it will bring back us to the RDS console where it is going to create it. And if you see the creation of the Aurora serverless will be done in, in seconds. Now, if you have seen that in, in one or two seconds, the cluster came back into available status. And in no time, you will also see that the node under the cluster also will come into available state. Yeah, if you see it, the minimal ACU that you see is 0.5 and the max currently configured is 64 ACUs. And I will show you when you modify the cluster, how soon would this cluster be able to modify and convert the ACUs? 
from 0.5 to 4. To modify the cluster, you would have to choose the cluster that you want to modify. And here your option of, when you choose it, you have an option to modify on the pane. When you click on this modify, it will take you to this page where you will be able to choose Aurora capacity settings. And here you can change the settings from 0.5 and you can modify it to four, which is going to be the test that I am doing on my test environment. When you click continue here, you would see that you have two options on how you want to apply these changes to your server, serverless cluster. You can either choose up the next scheduled maintenance window during which you, you can apply these changes to, or you can also choose an option to apply these settings immediately. But please keep in mind, whenever you are choosing an option to apply immediately, if there are any pending maintenance activities, you would also see that those pending maintenance activities would kick in that would extend the maintenance window that would apply for your cluster. So uh, we will drop a link on how you can check for the pending maintenance activities against your cluster. Once you make sure there are no pending activities, you can click on apply immediately or apply during scheduled maintenance window and uh, choose that option to modify the instance. Once it's modified, you would see that in no time it changed the ACOs from 0 0.4, 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 to 4. It was very quick. Having said that, I want to give you a, a additional benefit at the end of this presentation. Please stay tuned because during our sessions, we always keep questions, uh, getting questions from customers like, Harish, this is cool, but in near real time, how long will this cluster actually take to scale up? So I simulated the workload in one of my test environment I will show you how long or what would be the duration for the Aurora serverless it takes to scale up and scale down in the near real time. Please stay tuned. And now let's make a comparison between the features of provisioned Aurora versus serverless. If you look at the differences, you would see that Aurora serverless has almost the similar features that were supported in provision Aurora, which means whatever benefits you get in provisioned Aurora, you would have the similar features in serverless V2, which means you would be able to also have an opportunity to create read replicas. You would have an option to enable performance insights. These were the features that were not supported in the previous version of serverless V2. We continuously take the feedbacks from customer and we keep improving the services. Uh, having said that, all the feedbacks that we received from customers, we heard them, we implemented them, and all these features that you see as of today in serverless v2 are something that were not existing in the previous version of v1. And I'll give a pause here, and I'll see if uh, there are any questions. Right. So, hey, Harish, we did have a few questions that came through the chat there. Um, the first one is related to the way that it auto scales. So you as a customer pre-configure the min um, capacity units as well as the max capacity units, right? How, how would a customer baseline? So let's say for example, I'm new looking to migrate a workload to Amazon Aurora uh, serverless. I think it might be a good fit. How do I get a baseline of what min and max should be? That's a very good question, Clint. So Based on my experience, interact with customers in AWS, mm -hmm. I see that customers always try to compare the workload they have in on-prem with that of the cloud. So that would be a challenging part to answer because mm -hmm. on-prem, your traffic would always be within the network. But when you move to cloud, the network plays a key role on how long or how soon the traffic gets served, TTL and all that also matters. So to answer this question, what you can do is based on the current uh, capacity that you have for the databases on-prem, you would take the same configuration initially with the Aurora serverless and you can configure that as the base ACO or min ACO and then see if it is actually meeting the requirement. And if you see that even that capacity is not being consumed, where you can look for that in the CloudWatch metrics. You can Got look at CloudWatch metrics, read IO, write IO, read and write throughput. And if you see that the read and write throughputs are not even being met with the baseline of what you have configured, you can try to again scale down the minimum ACU 
to the lesser value and see if it makes sense. So it depends definitely on the customer's workload. So baselining, I definitely would say test it, which would be based on use case and go, go, go from there. Nice. Uh, so the question that came through there to sort of get a little bit further into this was from uh, Nasser, Nasser Titan, if I'm saying that correctly. They wanted to know, is it possible to auto scale the storage capacity? Auto scale the storage capacity. So yes. Aurora already does that auto scaling. So which means if you go with native RDS, you would have to provision the storage, mm -hmm. right? When you are launching an RDS, uh, MySQL, Postgres or SQL Server per se, you would have to configure the storage that you want. And it was a pain for customers to scale it because in, in native RDS, if you see, there is only one way. That means you already have to scale up. There mm -hmm. is no way going down. down right. And which is why it was challenging for customers to plan the storage to be able to provision. But with Aurora, it, it made life of customers easy, which means that you can scale the storage or you can uh, you not even scale, uh, configure the storage that you want by launching the cluster. All you do, even when you look at provisioned Aurora, you would only choose the compute nodes or instance type you want. In Aurora serverless, you only configure ACOs, which is compute. Storage will auto scale based upon the capacity requirement of the uh, data that needs to be stored, which means even from storage perspective, Aurora serverless really helps because you are paying as per the storage requirement that you are consuming. Nice. And the minimum ACU is 0.5 and then the maximum is 128, right? That is right. Perfect. Uh, one follow-up question for you here. This is uh, for a golden star for today. So we scale out the storage capacity. Let's say, for example, we go through and delete some data out of our table. Does it also reclaim storage capacity as well? So this is also a question I always keep getting asked by customers. Usually, so Aurora is not any different compared to the native databases, right? When you, when you, uh, if you take Postgres, for instance, if you completely delete huge records from the database or tables in the database, it will leave those vacuums. If you want to claim back those space, you definitely have to do some database maintenance activities, mm -hmm. which means you have to shrink the database or do some sort of cleanup to be able to reclaim that space. So if you delete the records, unfortunately, database will not immediately reclaim the space back. Got it. Hopefully that was a, a thorough explanation there, Nasser Titan. I think we covered all pieces of, the, of that question. Uh, so Harish, feel free to uh, continue along. Thank you, Clint. Team, please ask any questions you have. We are happy to uh, answer most of the questions or whatever questions you have. If not, we'll definitely get back to you. And after the uh, features uh, that we have compared between the provisioned Aurora versus Aurora serverless V2, now let's actually deep dive more into what exactly are the features that were introduced in Aurora serverless V2, which were not existing in V1, which will make Aurora serverless V2 even more cool and interesting. I'll hand it off to my colleague Kiran, who will do a deep dive into these features. Thank you, Harish. <clears throat> So uh, today we will be talking about some of the important uh, features uh, that has been introduced uh, in serverless v2 uh, when compared to the serverless v1 version. So one of the, uh, let's get started. So one of the key uh, ask from our customer feedback is like, how can we uh, use this for the production workloads, right? There was a time, like, you know, even with, with the V1, it is hard to find the scaling point when doing the instance upscaling and downscaling. So in V2, we introduced a new one called instance in place scaling. What that means is we achieve the instance scaling by through the in place scaling. Th this is the unique feature that has been introduced in the Aurora serverless V2, where it auto scales the instances within the milliseconds to meet the application workload needs. So now, like when we say the application workload, it load can be coming from the application. It can be a CPU driven, or it can be a memory crunch, right? Or it can be related to the network throughput. So our automation system will automatically detect if there is an internal pressure and it will expand the ACOs 
and by scaling up and also the down based upon the usage. So we will talk about that in a little bit deeper in the coming slides. But for now, let's understand like how this instance scaling can play a major role for the application. So application uh, where cannot take the downtime and uh, where it wants the instance up, uh, scaling up, that is where the serverless v, v2 comes into the picture. So if you have an application which is like, you know, we, you wanted, you don't want it to take any disruption in the workload, then yes, V2 is the one of the best option for you. So unlike Aurora serverless V1, V2 uh, uh, scaling happens, uh, does not need to wait for the scaling point, quite scaling point, we call it as. That reason is like in serverless V1, it used to wait for a longer time to find the quite point, right? So basically it used to there should be no long running queries or there should be no table logs or the temporary tables during that time when it is scaling up so it has in serverless v1 it has to wait until that quiet point uh, so this was the uh, feedback that we received from the customers and we have implemented that in the v2 and in the v2 you can scale the instance instantaneously so and the scaling down is also much faster when compared to the v1 so it uh, scales down 15x faster times uh, when compared to the v1 and we also use the heat management for allocating the databases that will not contend to any databases uh, to wait if there is any uh, resources are at the crunch with that said I will take a pause to see if there is any questions. Uh, hey, Karen. So I'm curious, one question that uh, that I had, and there's another one that we're gonna get to in the chat there. What's the cool down period look like? So let's say for example, uh, we had a, a scale out activity that occurred. How long would performance need to uh, decrease before the database reclaims those ACUs back? Right, that is a very good question, Clint. So I will be covering that point in the next coming slide like how this uh, scale up and down will happen in Aurora serverless v2. Let's get started. Gotcha. Yeah, hold on, the, the additional question, and maybe you're gonna get mm -hmm. to this as well, but is it possible for customers to schedule um, the, the scale out to like a, say a, a specific time or day of week? Uh, that question came from infamous underscore uh, PS. So this is scaling out operation, everything happening at the background, right? So you can uh, there is no way that you know if there is any pressure happening internally into the buffer pool this expansion will happen right so uh, scaling up and down is everything is done automatically you don't need to worry about uh, scheduling the task for aurora serverless everything will be taken care of by the automation gotcha okay um okay feel free to take it away if any other questions come through uh we sure. will get those answered Sure, thank you. Thank you so much. So here, let us understand how the buffer pool resizing happens as we as we understand, like, you know, how the resizing wants to happen in the serverless V2 is the quite common question, right? So let us understand how this happens. So as we all know about the buffer pool, right? This is the main cache in your database where all the activities will happen in Aurora serverless V2 also the same with the buffer pool. When the database scale up, it we scale up the buffer pool correspondingly, right? What that, that means is if the buffer pool sees any internal pressure, that means if it requires more resources, right? It will scale up the database to give more resources and it happens everything in the dynamic. What it, but in the background process, it constantly monitors the CPU CloudWatch metrics we have a database serverless capacity count that keeps the track of the ACU. ACU is nothing but Aurora capacity units that will be tracked background with the database capacity count and scales up and down based upon the workloads. So how this happens, there are two parameters in uh, these two engines as Harish mentioned. There are in MySQL, we have InnoDB buffer pool and in Postgres, we have the shared buffer. So by default, buffer pool uses the 75% to 
for the buffer pool, right? And 25% is given to the heap, which is used for the sorting operations. And now we talked about the scaling of the instances, right? How the scale up happens in the buffer pool. As I mentioned in the quick point, if there is any internal pressure in the buffer pool, it scales up. What, how does the scale down operation? This is a very interesting question, right? So let us understand that one. We have to scale down buffer pool in a cautious manner. The reason why, if we are sending the pages from the buffer pool to the disk and pulling the data from the, the disk will can cause the IO latencies, right? So to avoid prematurely evicting these pages from the buffer pool, we carefully and cautiously scale down the buffer pool. How? Like we use the mechanism called the least recently used algorithm or least frequently used algorithm. So these two are the most important factors that we consider when we are doing the scaling down the serverless instances. So if the least recently used is nothing but when your application is sending some queries, that will be least recently used. And most frequently used pages that are also kept in the buffer pool. And based upon the workload, it just expands the buffer pool, right? And if there are pages that need to be evicted slowly and cautiously that are kept as a warm pages, meaning those pages are least likely to be used by the application. Once we determine that the application is not no more using those pages, then we will evict those old pages to the disk. That's how we scale down the buffer pool by reclaiming the memory back. I would take uh, a little bit pause here to understand if there are any questions. Yeah, hey Karen, there was a there's a discussion going on in the in the chat here, so I thought maybe it might be a good opportunity for us together to provide some clarity. So Aurora is a database platform. How in the the serverless piece of it allows um, you as a customer to have the database automatically scale out the CPU and memory as well as uh, scale in the CPU and memory automatically without you as a customer having to take any action. Correct, Karen? Right. Right. Yeah. So if you compare that to an EC2 auto scaling group, you as a customer need to manage all of those EC2 instances. You need to worry about the patching. You need to worry about the operating system. You need to worry about all the underlying infrastructure. Right. They could run web servers. They can run databases inside of them that you self-manage on your own. The point being is, you as a customer own the uh, the life cycle of all of those servers. So yes, you can create an auto scaling group to automatically scale the, the number of servers in the group out and you can manage the scaling back in again, right? These are just uh, basically what we're doing here is giving you the ability at a database platform perspective to make that a lot more simple and easy, right? So if you were to compare it okay. to auto scaling groups to Aurora serverless, I was just trying to clarify that a little bit for some of the folks online. Sure. Perfect. Were you gonna? So, yeah, just to add a point here. So Aurora is a managed service, right? Whereas an EC2 instance is like an, uh, you are like running your own instances in the EC2 where you will not have the managed service, right? In Aurora, we will manage everything, the underlying volume, uh, when it comes to the instance scale, scaling up and down, yes, in serverless, that is also being taken care of because in Aurora, like, you know, provisioned, we heard like, you know, there is a, an ex it is a monolithic architecture where the storage and the uh, instance classes are decoupled, right? Mm -hmm. The storage is being ex uh, expanded automatically. And we have a uh, very good feedback from our customer. How can we automatically scale the instances also, right? That was the feature request always, uh, we always get from the customers. That's where the, Aurora Serverless V1 was being introduced in 2018. And that's how the journey has started with auto-scaling the instances, auto-scaling the storage. Right, cool. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, a good explanation from uh, there, Karen. I think we were able to uh, help clarify. So feel free to, to continue along. Right, so let's understand how the fine grain capacity adjustments will happen in the coming slide. As we all know, as Harish mentioned, like Aurora serverless capacity is measured in the Aurora capacity units, which is called as ACU. And each ACU is a combination of approximately two gigabytes of memory 
corresponding CPU and networking. And you can imagine this with the similar to the Aurora provisioned instance, right? So with the Aurora serverless V2, you can use the starting capacity as small as half ACUs, right? And the maximum it can go to 128 ACU. Unlike Aurora serverless V1, while doing, doing the scaling up and down, it used to use the double the capacity. For example, if you are using eight, GB of memory, it goes to the 16 GB, like double, double. It uses the double the capacity of the ACUs. However, that is also another feedback that we have received. And we worked on the serverless V2 saying that like, you know, it can increment with the fine grained capacity adjustment. That means you can increase the capacity unit of the ACU as lower as 0.5 to maximum of 128 uh, ACUs. Uh, for an example, let me tell you, if you are having the 32 ACUs, right, and you are working fine and uh, the application load is working fine and suddenly there is a load operation is coming and you need to increase the ACU. So you can increment the ACUs uh, from for, uh, 0.5, that is half ACUs, right? Like, you know, you just need like 33 ACUs, right? You can go to the 33 ACUs. But in Aurora Serverless V1, this was not the feature. So this has been introduced in Aurora Serverless V2. Now let us understand uh, how this uh, happens. Like, you know, we have talked about the instant scaling. We have talked about how the scaling happens up and down. Like, now we will talk what factors can trigger these scaling operations, right? So. The most important point I wanted to uh, mention is like scaling rate is dependent on the current size of your database, right? If the instance is higher and if like if your instance is already using a particular number of ACUs, then it goes faster to the current size. And if you are using the lower size, then it takes a little time. For Aurora Serverless V2, we also have an additional feature called like, you know, adding the read replicas, right? So when the writer and the reader, it basically our background operation will be taken care continuously tracking the utilization of those resources such as a CPU, memory, and the network. I will tell you how. So for the CPU utilization, let's say your application, you are writing some workload to your instances, right? And if you see there is a tremendous increase in the CPU threshold, which reaches to the 100% of your ACUs. That's where our automation detects and expands the instance class to provide more CPU util uh, utilization for your instances. Likewise, same with the memory as well. Like if the buffer pool instance uh, faces any internal pressure uh, in the buffer pool, then it automatically expands the memory. So that's how it does. And the network throughput, let's say if, you are, if your application is doing a bulk operation, right? And it requires more uh, network bandwidth. So our automation will automatically detect that there is a load coming from your application and it automatically expands the ACUs. So these three are the common factors that can trigger the scale up and down. Any questions? Hey, Kieran, uh, there was some discussion from infamous underscore PS around the multi AZ configuration. Is that synchronous or asynchronous at the time the cluster is created? Um, or is it something that you can adjust after the, the, the cluster is built or the, the, yeah, the cluster is built? Yes. And uh, multi AZ is basically is, it is a synchronous replication, whereas a read replica is a asynchronous replication, meaning uh, if you wanted to use the single box experience, then multi AZ is one of the option. Like it will be under right. one same region, right? Whereas if if, if you are if you are considering the read replicas, like you know scaling out for the different regions, that's where the read replicas in come into the picture, where it uses the logical level replication. As well as in Aurora, we do have the physical layer of replication using the global databases, which provides the uh, millisecond latency for the failover. So around um, the topic of resiliency and things of that nature, is that something that customers say, for example, the out of the gate, it's, you know, single AZ. Is that something you can change after the fact or add additional read replicas? 
Yes, uh, currently we do support uh, 0 to 15 and uh, in Aurora serverless v2, it expands. You can define these read replicas and it expands automatically. So one thing I want to add uh, on multi ac thing is, uh, uh, team, when you are configuring a cluster, it's not required for you to directly choose multi ac We recommend having multi ac because having multi ac will bring in a cool option to be able to automatically fail over to the mm -hmm. standby node if a primary node has any issue. So which is why if you are configuring the uh, Aurora cluster or even native RDS when you're provisioning it, so please make sure if you are provisioning it for your production instances, you configure multi-AZ so that you can choose or uh, have a uh, use benefit of get benefited by this feature to be able to automatically fail over onto the standby when a specific AZ is known. Because if you have production workload standing in a single AZ and if that specific AZ has any issues, because uh, we have 99 or 59s, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, SLA. SLA, but per se, whenever you happen to have any issues in a specific AZ, the complete database is going to be not available. Right. And in production, we don't want those scenarios, which is why multi-AZ is something we recommend. Having said that, you can have single AZ and you can change that single AZ to multi-AZ after the fact of the cluster creation happening. Perfect. Good stuff, folks. Uh, feel free to, uh, to continue along. All right. Now, let's talk about how can we migrate to Aurora Serverless V2. As usual, there are two options here in this picture. As we can see, we can use the provision uh, if you are running your instances on on-premise and if you are looking to migrate your instances to provisioned Aurora or Aurora serverless v2, these are the options that we have. We do have all the options which are supported for the provision Aurora MySQL is supported in Aurora serverless v2. So let us understand what are all the options that we have restoring from the snapshot, which is considered as one of the physical migration, which is faster, right? Whenever we consider the physical migration, it is always faster. So basically you are taking a snapshot of your RDS instance and you can restore it in the Amazon R MySQL database cluster. Let's say your instance is running on 5.6, then you, if you are provision, uh, like, you know, if you are trying to migrate it to Aurora provision, yes, you can do it while doing the, creating a read replica. But whereas in serverless v2, if you are trying to migrate uh, to serverless v2, currently, uh, my, for example, the MySQL it only supports 8.0, right? So you have to upgrade your instance to support to the 8.0, then you can migrate it to uh, Aurora serverless v2. So another option that comes is like dump and load. This is considered as a logical level migration. You can take a, uh, create a dump of your cluster uh, of your data and uh, you can import the data into your existing Aurora MySQL database cluster. And again, you have another way, logical level of migration, which is used as DMS option, database migration service, uh, which is heavily being used for the heterogeneous migrations. And let's say if you're having any commercial database instance or like if you're trying to migrate from any other, like, you know, let's say Postgres to MySQL if you wanted to migrate, right? So that's where the my DMS comes into the picture. As well as if you wanted to do the homogeneous migration, then yes, you can still do the same thing. Uh, the both options are available for the provision as well as Aurora serverless v Restoring the snapshot from the S3 is the one of the easiest and the coolest option and the fastest option about all. Like if you wanted to take a backup and uh, send it to the S3 and you, from there you can restore it to the Aurora provision or you can uh, do it with the Aurora serverless v2. Now we have talked about how to migrate from on-premise to the Aurora provision, right? Or from the RDS MySQL to Aurora provision. Now let us understand what are the other options that are having if you are trying to migrate to uh, from Aurora serverless v1 to v2 in the next slide. So here, as we can see, there are options called cloning, uh, a fast cloning with a cool feature of the Aurora where uh, you can test all your instances by using the cloning. That option is available for converting your v1 to v2. And again, uh, taking the snapshot of your uh, Aurora serverless v1 and uh, 
uh, restoring that particular snapshot in v2 is another option but here the downtime is incurred while doing the snapshot restore so that needs to be taken into the consideration right so another way that you can do is native replication yes you can use the native level replication to migrate it to the aurora serverless v2 uh, i would like i would like to take a pause here and uh, to see if there are any questions for me uh, no, feel free to uh, to continue along. I did answer one there about uh, rolling back using snapshots as well as backups to go back to RDS. But yeah, feel free to, to continue along, Kieran. All right. Thank you so much, Clint. So let's move to the pricing part. Like, you know, this is the most important part. Like, you know, everyone wants to understand what is the cost would be for the uh, serverless V2, right? So here, as we can see, uh, there will be a cost based on Aurora capacity unit, and there will be a storage built in the GB and IO consumed, right? Backups, everything, right? So here we need to understand one important point is uh, Aurora capacity unit for Aurora serverless V1 is approximately six cents, whereas uh, for the Aurora serverless V2, it has been increased to 12 uh, per hour. That is the only change. Other than that storage, IOPS, and backup, cost everything remains the same but only the way that uh, uh, it increases is for the acu level of uh, uh, acu cost on top of it we also have the additional features which are supporting for the v2 right for example global database uh, read replicas and also the rds proxy we also have the performance insights which was not having uh, in the serverless v1 right so these performance insights also can take a little bit of additional cost uh, added to the Aurora serverless uh, V2, depending upon your workload. So um, we already provided a lot of cost optimization by providing fine-grained increments, which I mentioned earlier, like you can increase the instances by using the half capacity of ACU, right? That's the huge increment that you can cost benefit that you can get in the Aurora serverless V2. And I want to uh, tell one point here. If your workload, if your application workload is a spiky workload, and if it is uh, using uh, uh, where the workload are like going up for during a particular time and going uh, down like you know low on a particular time, then the spiky workloads we call it as that's where the serverless P2 comes into the picture. And if you are having a provision. Uh, instances like you know if you have a steady workload and you were taking benefit of already uh, uh, reserved instances with the provision instances then yes the provision the aurora will be the best option for you coming to the pricing pass now with that said uh, i would like to hand over it to my colleague uh, harish where he will be demonstrating you a quick demo on how uh, this aurora serverless up and scaling up and down happen with uh, by simulating the actual workload harish over to you thank you giran uh, and uh, team thank you for staying till the end of this presentation so like we promised we wanted to show you in near real time how long will the actual Aurora serverless cluster take to scale up and cool down? And just a, uh, a note I want to make, when I play this video, you would see that the video uh, plays very fast because the actual time it took was very long and I wanted to shrink and make sure that uh, I cover the questions and the topic and I want to deliver it to the uh, audience. So uh, please bear with me that this video is fast. <laughs> And if you look at this, you would be able to get to the RDS console. The way I showed you, you can get here either by searching for RDS in AWS console, or you can also uh, get to this page. If you are using RDS frequently, you will see that on the frequently used services. When you get here, you would choose the RDS cluster. And here you have, an, uh, uh, what do you say, CloudWatch metrics called serverless capacity. And what I did is in the background, I simulated the workload against this specific Aurora serverless cluster that we launched. And once we launched it, we see that it was by default met with 0.5 ACUs. And slowly when the workload spiked, which I simulated at around the 936, it automatically, it immediately scaled up. And if you see, it scales up to nine. And in between, I also again uh, uh, launched another workload when it was scaling down, which is why you would see that it scales down and again scales up. And there was a question by one of the customer uh, in the chat that 
how long will it actually take to scale down you would see that the scale up was very fast it went up from 0.5 to 8 acos in no time but while scaling down what happens is it it will automatically look for a couple of features like how many active reads are being done on a specific page based on that it want to make sure that there is no impact to the connections that are in flight which is why what we do is we check to make sure the connections that are in flight are not being killed or disconnected but if there are any uh, inactive pages we would try to drop it down which is why if you see the scale down operation is slow compared to the scale up operation and totally uh, when you look at the time it it took to completely scale down it was about 20 minutes so from the time i simulated the workload to completely scale down to 0.5 it took around like 20 minutes so it is exactly aligning with the cloudwatch metrics that i showed at the present scenario uh, which is why i wanted to make sure i cover it in the near real time workload to show how long it will actually take so for any workloads that actually fit this use case of where you would have to automatically scale and scale down at the same time be in a specific uh, budget serverless would be ideal fit that that is the demo i wanted to show so overall it took around 20 minutes for the scale up and scale down operation having said that this is the uh, whole presentation we wanted to share on aurora serverless and the features that were covered so uh, now it's an open uh, floor team please ask if you happen to have any questions nice uh thanks harish thanks kiran for taking a, a few minutes out of your day to join us um and i really appreciate the folks online for all the questions and staying interactive and keeping it live and exciting today on aws supports you we discussed uh and introduced you to amazon aurora serverless v2 We compared and contrasted some of the differences between provisioned Aurora as well as serverless v2 and even serverless v1, um, and we also talked about some tips that you can use to migrate to the platform. Um, so please, if you have any comments about the show or any ideas for future episodes, you can email us at awssupportyou@amazon.com. Uh, we definitely would like to uh, to hear your feedback, and who knows, your topic might uh, result in a future episode of AWS Supports You. Uh, we air every Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, and next Monday, December 19th, we're going to be doing a reinvent recap uh, on QuickSight, specifically the QuickSight service uh, with Rudy Chetty. Uh, so, folks, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us on AWS Supports You. We'll see you next week, and happy cloud computing! Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.